Okay. So, um, for the our exam right before spring break, um, the class average was just shy of seventy four percent, which you know that makes me happy. Um, there were there was one question that nobody got right. Um, it was the question number. Let's see. Oh, uh, number twelve. The area between the start codon and the stop codon is known as the blank. It was the reading frame, but nobody got that question right. So you know, there you go. Everybody gets the point. Um, and then the other one that I threw out was the next one. On April 25th, 1953, Blank and Blank <clears throat> published a paper describing the double helix of DNA uh, using data that belonged to somebody they obtained through less than moral means. Um, so that one was some one that what was that one? Um, so number 13, yeah, the next one. Um, so that was a three-pointer. Um, and that one was hard for lots of folks, which is understandable. When it before as I was like. All right, I'm like, is this a fair question? Uh, we'll see. Um, but uh, so anyway, it's uh, Francis Crick and James Watson um, published the structure of the double helix using data that they said, you know, yoinked from, um, what's your face, Rosalind Franklin. So um, that was one that, that most people got wrong. So if you got it right, ha ha, you got three extra credit points. If you did it, you just got three points. Um, so those were the, the ones that, uh, you could have got extra points on. So there was really 119 points possible, um, in this exam with including the extra credit questions. Um, so, um, I feel, you know, okay about how, how people did. Um, one thing that I noticed that there was a lot of folks that just didn't answer some questions. And so if you don't answer a question, I can't like fudge it, right? So like um, there was one person that on that on that um, paper about Francis Crick and stuff, they, uh, they didn't know the answer, but they wrote things that were funny. And I was like, that was funny. So here you get a point for being funny, you know? So if you just leave them blank, then like, I can't do anything for you, um, you know, but if you guess or, you know, put something and then I'll try to, I mean, we'll see, <laughs> but when, when they're just blank, then um, the other thing that you can do is look for little hints about the questions that you don't know the answer to in the rest of the exam. Um, I try to read those little nuggets for you guys. Um, one thing that I thought we would try for the next exam is instead of having these like bullshit attendance questions, um, what I'm going to do is ask you guys to write an exam question based on the material that we went over the previous time. And so then we'll have this big question made from everybody in the class and I'll draw um, probably around 50% of the exam questions from that question bank. And I'll make that available to you guys the week before the exam. Does that sound good? Okay. Um, so if you're thinking of that, I'll, I'll um, hang on to the um, the ability to modify language, tweak, you know, questions. If you um, tell me what the right answer is and it's not actually correct, then I will make sure that you know you understand that correctly. Um, but I think having that, building that um, from your input was going to be useful for both, for all of us. <laughs> um, okay, questions about the exam, things that you guys want to talk about. Um, remember, if you're getting over 90% average over the first three exams, you don't have to take the final. So if you fall into that category, then go through for you. Um, we just have one more exam for the yeah, um, and then we'll have the final. And so, if you're if you're averaging ninety or or better um, for those first three exams, then you you're off the hook. 
Um, all right. Should we talk about gene expression now? All right, let's do that. Okay, so these slides are up on Canvas if you guys want to follow along. Um, also, be thinking about what you're going to have your little exam question be as you're as we're going over this material. I'm going to turn off this prompt thing for a while. Mm -hmm. What we want. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Gene regulation. This is chapter 16. We're going to do this to the fast and dirty version because we were supposed to do this before the exam, but like when I was out of town, we got behind. So here we go, real fast. Um, okay. First of all, let's remember the, the central dog. Uh, this is my friend's dog. I went down to Phoenix to watch this guy while she was. Um, she had to go to Mexico for work. And um, anyway, he, I woke him up to take this picture and he's like, your joke is stupid. So why did you wake me up? Um, okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about the central dog. Let's remember that because we've had a week to forget everything, which is certainly long enough to forget everything. Um, so let's... Anybody want to give me a short version of the central dogma? <clears throat> We're going to start with something. DNA. We're going to start with DNA. We're going to draw an arrow over here. Transcription RNA. Transcription. And that's going to come and give us RNA. And then we're going to draw another little arrow. Translation to protein. All right, so there we go. There's our central dogma. Um, this is what? Replication. Um, yeah, so we can have. Replication. We can even have this thing called reverse <laughs> translation, but that doesn't happen very often. Um, we'll talk about that when we talk about the biotech stuff. Um, okay, so there we go. That is the central dogma. We need to remember that stuff. Um, okay, so the way that we regulate gene expression is through this process, right? Through these processes of transcription and translation. Because um, we're using, we're turning DNA into some kind of functional product. Usually that's a protein. Sometimes it is an RNA. If we're talking about of creating ribosomal RNA, remember rRNA, that's the final product. Or if we are um, talking about tRNA, that's not translated into a protein. That's the final product of transcription. Um, okay, so why do we want to have gene regulation? Well, so think about your body. You have eye cells and liver cells and stomach cells and skin cells and you know all those kinds of different kinds of cells. All your cells that do all these different jobs have the same genes contained in each of them. But they all express those genes differently depending on you know what genes are turned on and off, how when they're turned on, when they're turned off, how much those products are being made, etc. Okay, so we need that for we need gene regulation for cell differentiation. All of our cells don't do the same job, don't have are making the same amount of proteins all the time. And also, why would you make something that you don't need? That's stupid. All right. So we'll talk first about prokaryote and eukaryote gene expression. And um, let's just remember in our prokaryotes, there's no nucleus, right? 
So gene or uh, transcription and translation are happening pretty much simultaneously. They're not separated by space or time. But when we're talking about eukaryotes, it is separated by both space and time, right? We have transcription happening in the nucleus that mRNA that's produced that gets modified into its mature form. And you guys can maybe remember some of those modifications. We've got our, our five prime cap and our poly A tail. We get rid of the, in, the introns. All right, and now that will leave the nucleus and go find the ribosome. And so there's a lot more um, possibilities for gene regulation in eukaryotes than there is in prokaryotes. Um, okay, nope, that's backwards. There we go. All right, so of course, prokaryote gene regulation is going to be simpler. Um, I already said that. So gene regulation is happening. Um, is only determined by the rate of transcription, right? So going from DNA to RNA. Um, so there's some regulatory molecules that can either slow down or completely stop DNA ref or uh, transcription. There's activators that can like turn it up, or there's inducers. They can say, all right, now we're going to turn it on. So we've got repressors that reduce the rates of transcription. We've got activators that increase the rate of transcription. And then we've got inducers that turn it on. All right, so let's first talk about um, oh, <laughs> repressible. I think autocorrect fixed that for me. <laughs> it fixed it. Um, all right, so now we are okay. So let's talk about um, repression. So tryptophan, you guys may or may not recall, is an amino acid. Um, we, our body, can't make it, but E. coli can make it. Or if they, if it's present in their environment, then like, why well, make crap that you can just get? Right. So uh, I kind of gave you a hint here. So why would a bacterium want to turn off or slow down the production of tryptophan? Same like they just in the environment, so you're saying you're making it, but Yeah, yeah. Why would you make something that you can just get from your environment? So we're not going to waste energy making this stuff because it just can, we can just absorb it through our plasma membrane. Okay. Um, all right. So let's look at this. So here we have our promoter region. We have our operator, and then we have the actual genes for making this amino acid. When tryptophan is present, it binds with this repressor molecule that's hooked on to the operator. And it blocks polymerase boink, from actually um, making that mRNA. So we have the tryptophan when it's present. It binds with the receptor molecule. Um, with, yeah, so, so it's tryptophan binds with the repressor. The repressor is stuck on the operator. The polymerase just is physically blocked from transcribing these genes. All right. And it, when it's absence, so there's no tryptophan here, the repressor doesn't bind with that operator region. And the polymerase is able to just go on and do its own thing and make that gene or, or turn that DNA into RNA. And then that RNA will go on and. Be, um, be transcribed to make the enzymes that can produce the tryptophan. Okay, does that make sense to everybody so far? All right, all right, so now let's talk about activators. So, lactose, remember, this 
is uh, the chemical structure of lactose. You don't have to ever remember the chemical structure of anything for my class. But what, the, um, what we need to remember is that there's this glucose molecule um, making that uh, bond with uh, the lactose molecule. So this is a disaccharide. Um, all you need to really know is that there's two different kinds of sugar put together. All right, so when glucose is lacking, our little friend E. coli that lives in our guts can use lactose as per energy. So if we're lacking glucose, and this guy's here, hey, look at that, there's a glucose molecule hooked on there. We can just like pop in that in instead. But this bond is hard to break. So, there are genes for making the enzyme that can break that bond. Now, um, okay, so this camp thing, this is just a, a certain kind of molecule. You don't really need to know the details. Um, it just signals that glucose is low. So it accumulates when glucose is low. And what it's going to do is it's going to bind with this other protein called CAP. What that stands for, you can look it up in your textbook if you really want to know, but we don't really care because we're talking about big picture things. Um, okay, so it's going to bind with the promoter region, right? And so it's going to say, and here's the polymerase, it's going to chug, 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 chug along to produce those, the mRNA that will be translated into the enzymes that can break that bond. Now, when that, um, that camp molecule is not present in the abundance of glucose, then it doesn't bind to that promoter region. And so polymerase just kind of goes along boop, 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 and makes that. So that's when, um, yep, yeah, okay. So we're gonna talk about now the inducers we're going to stick with this um, lactose region. Um, so what these are are um, proteins that bind to the activation um, or repress. So they activate or they repress um, translation depending on, or sorry, transcription depending on uh, the environment needs and you know if we actually need this. So we have already discussed that E. coli can use lactose when there's not enough glucose around. Okay, so we just we just looked at this so we can have um, so when we don't have lactose, right? So if there's no lactose, then producing the enzymes to make to digest lactose, that's not gonna be a useful thing to do, right? Like why would you make something to break it to down the thing that isn't there? So um, so now we have boom, transcription is blocked by this repressor hanging out on this operator region. When lactose is present, it hooks onto that repressor. It goes away off the operator. So it's saying, okay, yeah, you know what? Go ahead and make these enzymes because our sugar that we want to break down is actually here. Um, okay, so if lactose is there, transcription proceeds kind of at a slow rate, right? Because we don't need it a lot as long as there's glucose present. But, okay. So now I want you guys to find somebody that's sitting close to you and talk about these questions. <clears throat> um, when where you don't have lactose or glucose, um, no, in the presence of both lactose and glucose, would we see these, this, these genes that create the enzymes that break down lactose, would we see that they're present? Would we want to make a lot of copies of the enzymes that break down lactose if glucose and lactose is there? So talk about that with your the person sitting next to you or near you. I'm gonna turn around and get up and in with those guys. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So logic it out. Think about it. Would you make an enzyme to break down lactose if glucose is present? <laughs> yeah. So we got so lactose and glucose are both hanging around in the environment. Where are we going to see high rates of transcription of the enzymes that are going to break down lactose? All right, so how are we feeling, you guys? Weird. All right, so <laughs> um, if we have both lactose and glucose floating around, are we going to see a high rate of transcription of the enzymes that break down lactose? Yes. So if you think yes, take no. All right, we got a, a few people on team no, so why, why not? Well, yeah. there's already an abundance of glucose. Right. So that glucose is what you want to use for energy, that right. And using lactose is going to require more energy to break that enzyme part. So are you going to say? Are you going to add yeah, anything to that? I was going to just add to that. Uh, the glucose is abundant in terms of transcribed genes. Right. Because you don't need that Exactly. So yeah, you're not gonna spend money that you don't have to, right? Uh, well, I yeah. <laughs> you're not gonna spend energy. <laughs> Why run when you can walk? <laughs> There's no T Rexes chasing me. It's fine. Um okay. So, okay, so if we don't want to turn on those genes, we got to do something, right, to regulate that. All right. I'm going to tell you what they're going to do now. So here's the second part of this figure. We already talked about this side. So now if we have, if we're lacking, okay, so so here we have, um, hold on, I got to, I got to reorient myself here. Okay. So lactose is present here, boop, it, your repressor goes away. 
Now, if we have lactose present, we also have to have this camp thing that we talked about before. That, that molecule is saying, hey, 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 there's not enough glucose here. We got to do something else. Right? Um, and so in the, in the presence of, um, in the camp, we have um, that repressor is off the operator. We can have translation or transcription. Um, but then we'll also have that repressor um, when, if we don't have this camp thing, if there's enough glucose around, um, the repressor is going to hang on to that operator. Okay, so there's kind of two steps in creating these enzymes to break down lactose. Right, we have to have lactose present and we have to have um, not enough glucose. And so this is an example of induction um, by increasing and, and decreasing. And now we can talk about eukaryotes, and of course, eukaryotes are more complex. Okay. So there's lots more ways that can happen. Um, so we, we talked about how transcription and translation are both separated in space and time. And so we can have gene regulation happening at these. We see it at four different levels. We see it at this thing called epigenetic level. We see it at the transcription level, like we saw with prokaryotes. We can see it after transcription and we can see it after translation. Hey, lists of four things, they tend to end up being questions on quizzes and exams and stuff. Okay. So let's talk about epigenetics. So these are changes to gene expression without changing the actual DNA sequence itself. These changes um, to gene expression, they can last through several cell divisions. So you can have epigenetic effects within your, the somatic parts of your body, the, the cells that make up your body. You can also see epigenetic effects in the in your sex cells. And so we can see it happening through uh, generations. We've actually been able to detect epigenetic changes through up to four generations. Um, the best, the most common way that we see this is um, the, the DNA strand um, that on that phosphate sugar backbone. Um, is going to be methylated, which is just fancy science talk for an extra carbon and three more hydrogens plopping onto it somewhere. And so there's just this extra, we have our nice little double helix. Let me go grab that model real quick. Okay. So we've got our, our phosphate sugar backbone creating the, the sides of our, our ladder. Um, and then at some point, there's going to be a, a few extra atoms that just hook on to that. So that's going to make that, that portion where it's methylated just a, like a little bit bigger. And that is going to prevent polymerase from being able to hook onto it, just because it's got like an extra little knob sticking out. Um, okay, so let's remember, here's our DNA. It's wrapping around this protein called a histone. That histone DNA combo makes up the nucleosome. And here's how these um, histones look um, under a, an electron micrograph. So you can see these little tiny string things between these knobs. Um, that's the DNA molecule. And then we can see these knobs are the proteins. So that's what it looks like IRL. So those um, histones can shift, right? So if we've got two things that are 
are wound up. We can actually see them kind of shift over a little bit. And that those histones kind of will open up a new portion of the DNA that is now available for that polymerase to attach to it. Um, so if it's wound up on this one thing, it can't, the, the polymerase can't attach to that, but if that part unwinds because the histones have shifted, um, then it's, um, then the, the RNA polymerase can do that. Okay, so, so that's what this image is showing. Um, so these little purple things are supposed to represent the DNA and these blue little crosshatch things are the histones. Um, depending on how close together or far apart those that methylation is, it's going to cause those histones to either pack together or spread out. Um, and then this um, acetyl group, this is just a more stuff. Um, it's like there's an oxygen atom and some carbon and some hydrogen and some stuff. So this is just a bigger group. Um, so in this form, that that gene of interest is not accessible. Um, but when those met the methylation, the methyl groups go away and we have these acetyl groups hang on, then it spreads it out because there's more molecular interactions, and now that's accessible. Okay. Uh, why did I put this in here? I don't remember. I think it's just a nice summary of all this stuff. So that's for your ease of studying. All right. Um, I don't remember what this YouTube video is. I made this PowerPoint like a week ago and I forgot. um yeah i think it's one of those like really cheesy educational ones so i'll let you watch that on your own time um <laughs> so we have these three stages you know what let's do it let's do it why the hell no here we go oh we should probably have sound See what that does. There's sound. That's a lot of sound. Ooh, that's not what I wanted. Transcription is the process of making RNA high quality entertaining. Several key factors are involved in this process, including DNA, transcription factors, RNA polymerase, and ATP. 